Ah, Tan Shi, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, before we begin, I think you guys all know what I'm going to do. I'm going to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Um, I want to thank you, everybody, for being here. I also want to thank our ancestors and for the beautiful day that we have outside for helping us with this day and to make this a really successful conference. Um, we've had a lot of positive uh, feedback from everybody. And uh, so I'm really excited to start the second day. So the first day was a little bit about gathering information, and today is about using that information to dig a little bit deeper. So the first half of the day, we're going to do a fishbowl. And then in the afternoon, everybody's going to engage in workshops where we can look towards developing some deeper understands and maybe even a couple of products that we can use that, we'll that later on in the process we'll send out to all of our participants who came today. So to get us started, I'd like to ask my presenters to come up on stage while I get everybody going. Um, so if you would come up here. Um, so the idea of doing a fishbowl was brought to me last year. It was an idea of having a panel discussion, but more in a de in more digging deeper into the issues to find a little bit more. The idea is to have a, a number of participants answer questions, to interact with each other, to dig a little bit deeper, to ask, I keep using that word, I have to stop. Um, to work towards finding a deeper meaning and to be a little bit self-critical, a little bit constructive, right? Because oftentimes what happens when you have a panel discussion is that people ask the surface level questions or they don't actually get to dig into this. And so that's what the whole point of this panel discussion is. We're going to start off the conversation. We have a number of questions that the, that the group met with yesterday and decided they wanted to look, talk about and so we'll get started with that. But there is going to be an opportunity for people in the audience to ask questions. So we're going to break it into two halves so that we don't have to sit here for three hours straight. Um, that'll allow you to get coffee and use the washroom. Um, so at some point in time, I will ask people to come up and we'll use the microphone in the middle of the audience to ask, get you to ask your questions. So before we get going, I'm going to introduce you to my panel. Most of you have already met these people in one way or another, um, but I want to recognize everybody before we begin. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Maria Campbell for coming up and participating. Uh, Maria is, a, is an author, a filmmaker, director, a cultural leader, a cookum, a mother, and someone I call a dear friend and somebody I learn a lot from and who also is my Okimao, one of two Okimaos. And for those who don't know Cree, that's boss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I would like to thank you for being here. As well, we have our, our, our keynote speaker, Corey Wilson. And for those of you who don't remember, Corey Wilson is the Executive Director for the Indigenous Initiatives and Partnerships for the British Columbia Institute of Technology. And then we also have, and not least, we have our newest senior leader on campus, Jackie Ottman, the Vice Provost of Indigenous Engagement here at the University of Saskatchewan. These three people will be representing the side of Indigenizing Inc. Academy. On the other side of the fence, and not that there is a fence, but maybe we'll find out. I'm just checking, you guys see? They're prepared. All right. You look like bait. All right, we'll start with David. David Porter is the CEO of eCampus Ontario and the primary face of Ontario Learning and Learning Consortium. Welcome. We also, we have Heather, Ro Heather Ross, who is our local champion for open educational resources and educational development here at the Gwena Moss Center for Teaching and Learning. And we have our third person, our champion for open, who is not necessarily, wasn't able to make it today, and she'll be up on the large screen over here, and I believe I can see her waving. Uh, this is Mary Burgess, who is, who is the executive director for BC Campus, which supports all of the BC's post-secondary system. So uh, thank you and welcome, and thank you for being here from afar. <clears throat> okay, so we got to get this started in a nice, easy, gentle fashion. Let them get started. So I'm going to ask from, starting with Maria, I would like you, all, th all f six of you, I'd like if you wouldn't mind to tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, what is the, why are you championing this topic? Um, what, what do you hope to gain from this work in a, both a personal and a professional level? Right? So we're getting real here. All right, so we're going to start real and stay real. All right, and then, if, and then tell me why you were willing to be up on stage today. Because Marie? you made me. <laughs> <laughs> See, now we're getting real. All right. Oh, okay, sorry. I guess we'll start it off with microphones. Good, we don't have to shout. Oh, there's two to share. Uh, 
Okay, I'll tell you about myself. I'm a great grandmother. Um, I'm a grandma and a mom, and I'm uh, I'm a lodge keeper. I um, I really am concerned about how indigenous <coughs> knowledge is used. Um, and normally, we are, we're not supposed to be up here talking about stuff like this. So I feel like, you know, it makes me kind of nervous. But I also, I find things like open scary. I don't know anything about it, very little. And, um, but feel like I at least should be able to say something. And also be able to take it back to, to, to my own... Uh, uh, elders that I work with. Um, what else? So I'm here to champion traditional knowledge, I guess. <laughs> and why do I do this work on a, on a personal level? Um, I'm, as I told you yesterday, I'm of the generation where we were really mentored to, to uh, to protect language and culture, and um, I often tell people that well, an analogy that I make is that each one of us who speak our language or have been taught, given cultural teachings, that at one time it was like a puzzle that was finished and somebody came along and picked it up when it was done and tossed it up in the air and the pieces flew all over. and. All of us have a little piece. We don't have all of it. We might have two or three here and there. And we were taught by our mentors that it was our job to, to find each other and try to put those pieces back together so that we could rebuild and reclaim. And that's been, uh, at least in this area, the, one of the, the things, the responsibilities that we were left with as, as knowledge keepers. And, and these words are really difficult when you say them in, in places like this because those are not the words that we use when we're, when we're talking among ourselves. So, uh, so that's, that's why I'm here. And on a professional level, I, I also think that it's important for, for me, it's, my, it's been my life's work to pass that on to, uh, to uh, young indigenous people. And it's also important that we, that people like myself try to help non-Indigenous people understand that. I didn't do that very well as a young woman because I'm, I'm as I'm sure you're aware, I'm very opinionated. I have a, a bad temper sometimes. But as I get older, it's getting easier. So I'm more gentle with, with people. Uh, but it's important for us to be able to respect and, and work together um, simply because times have changed even since I was a little girl. So, yeah, so that on a professional level, that's why. But I also, uh, it's all, it was also impressed on me that we were given that information and it's our job to be responsible and, and protect it. So. Hello. Um, so as you know, I'm Corey Wilson. I'm Kwakwakiwak, Northern Vancouver Island. Um, about myself, so I don't have any grandkids yet. Um, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> even though my son's almost 27, he's still doing very well, so that's good. Um, I have four kids, so it's, that's a lot of obviously what keeps me going. I think, uh, as Maria said, it's, it's how we're growing up, how we're brought up, how we're trained, if you will, by our elders and by our mentors. My granny is a very strong, powerful woman, and she would always ask us at the end of the day, what did you do to make the world a better place? I didn't understand why she's asking me this when I'm seven years old, because um, I didn't really know I had power to change the world. Um, and so she had a lot of, and this is how we were raised as kids in our family, to, you, you're raised to make a difference, to serve uh, in whatever capacity, identify your strengths and identify your talents and use the gifts that the Creator gave you to make the world a better place. And, 
And for me, I kind of came to education in a roundabout way. As you know, I practice law. And I think that practice that was only criminal defense and some family law really showed me how people come, nobody, want, nobody comes into the world, oh, I want to be a criminal, I want to be this, I want to be that. They end up there by circumstances that in most cases are, you know, 98% of the time beyond their control. So then it just got me, th what happened to these people? What are they missing? How did I get the privilege that I have? Both my parents have many university degrees. There was no option in our family but to go to university, and we were fully supported in that process, um, and in many ways micromanaged to do that. Uh, <laughs> you know, while my cousins and various others were out doing you after school, you had to do, you either were doing school sports or volunteering, working somewhere, and then studying, and it was only when the studying was done could you do with something else. So that came from a very strong foundation. And then also in terms of the uh, why I, what I'm here to champion, I'm here to champion that access because knowledge is power. And when you know better, you do better. And for, for me, access, and I remember my granny when I was in law school and I was writing a paper about how the potlatch, which is our cultural traditions, is in itself a, a, a legal system. And... Uh, she said, well, that's great to write this, but if the old people can't understand what you're writing, then it's no use writing any of this. So, and then actually I was criticized by the, there was other issues going on here as well, but um, by the instructor that was to mark my paper that said it wasn't sophisticated enough and it wasn't, and I said to her, and, I, and so when I of course challenged it and I, and I said, look, this is what I was taught by my grandmother. If our old people can't understand it, then there's no point in writing this information. So I think maybe that's where I got this idea of accessibility and that knowledge has to be accessible to all groups of people. And, you know, I do agree there's a limit, of course, and we'll get into that. I know about traditional knowledge and what can be shared and what can't be shared. So that's kind of my personal work. And you see it when you give, all you need is to have that one student that you open their mind and they change their entire life. And they, you know, I one of my proudest moments was when one of my students actually got called to the bar and she came to me having just been released from jail for um, assaulting her husband, uh, self-defense actually on her husband, but she nearly killed him. And uh, she got released from jail. She got her children back from foster care and she actually graduated from law school and got, got was called to the bar some about within about 10 to 12 years after being released from actually custody in Saskatchewan. So. Um, knowledge is power and, and providing people access to knowledge and access to that, uh, to what they may not have had growing up, I think is absolutely vital and I think a responsibility that we all have. And another thing that keeps me going as well is as Indigenous people, we're often defined by our experiences, but how do we help Indigenous people uh, be defined by their choices rather than defined by our experience? And we talked about this yesterday that, you know, we come into this world and we all have challenges that we have to face but we can choose to be defined by that or we can choose to um, make different choices and we have to empower and support people to make those choices, which is when you know better, you do better. So providing that knowledge and access is I think very important. Thanks very much, I'm David uh, Porter. I uh, work in Toronto, but I live in Vancouver. So I'm sort of somewhat bi-coastal or bi-central or something. Um, I've two grandkids and one more on the way. So I've been in the education sector for a really, really long time. And uh, the first of my family to go to university, uh, immigrant parents who came to Canada in the post-war era, um, education was valued um, very much like Corey's experience, micromanaged through high school, and ensured that I was going to do better than my parents perceived they had done. <clears throat> so I come to this whole notion of openness and access uh, from the perspective of equity and providing an opportunity for everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about open educational resources, open pedagogy, open practices. And for some in our movement, it's really about radical transparency and uh, reclaiming the means of production for educational resources and opportunities and putting it back into the hands of the people who actually benefit from them. So I don't have an anti-publisher bent, 
but I'm here to state that I think we uh, own a lot of knowledge and we should govern a lot of knowledge that happens in our community of practice. Um, I believe that education is about sharing knowledge. I believe we should be granting freedoms, not imposing restrictions. I believe that teaching is actually about sharing. And I believe that collaboration is really an opportunity to open up possibilities for working with peers and working with students. And when you take that perspective, education becomes a more community-based and community-spirited kind of way of thinking. Um, there was a lot of talk yesterday um, within our groups and through Corey's keynote about reconciliation. And I don't know how to be a great ally to our indigenous colleagues yet. But I think we're all willing to learn to do that. And I'm willing to share lots of things that I know and things that I produce, particularly when they benefit others. And so I think what motivates me to be here is the opportunity to listen and learn, to share what I might have that contributes to bettering our education system, and kind of addressing um, the social justice of the whole country, uh, providing opportunity, affordance, access, affordability, and a reversal of trends that took a long time to build up and need to be addressed directly now. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Heather Ross, and I'm from here at the U of S. And if you work here at the U of S, you've probably seen me at your door harassing you about using open. Um, I do have a bit of an anti-academic traditional textbook publisher bent. Um, I, um, I was raised in a house where my father, my parents took education very seriously. And my father has a, a university degree and he served on our local school board for eight years and was heavily involved in community and education was everything. There was no question we, my brother and I were going to post-secondary. It wasn't an option. We weren't asked, you were going. Um, it wasn't always a good educational experience for me. Uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter now, and one of the reasons I do this personally is part of it is this idea that my parents um, made clear that we, we have to make the world a better place, and right now we really need to be working on that in a lot of ways. But I also want to make it, education better for my daughter and her friends and, um, and her peers. Um, I, th I believe heavily that we should be sharing more. <laughs> Um, right now, people, people write academic articles that get published in journals. They're not paid for it. Dee Dee Dawson gave a talk yesterday and talked about a chemistry journal that the yearly subscription costs an institution about $35,000. Uh, they don't pay for the content. Um, they just make the money off of it. And we need to change that model, and we need to change it for textbook publishing, and we need to get students to stop being just consumers of information, but collaborators and contributors to it. And so I, I feel very passionate about open, but at the same time, I've had a lot of conversations with Maria and with Rose Roberts, and I want to know the right way, the, the ethical and the respectful way that we can work with um, in, including indigenous knowledge in this materials that doesn't cross the line, that is ethical and responsible, and that we can help share those practices with others so that we can be getting this right. Thank you. Um, I'm Jackie Ottman, and I'm Anishinaabe, Nakwe, um, originally from Fishing Lake, First Nation actually still am, <laughs> so um, which is uh, which is two and a half hours east of here, and um, the the first uh, probably four years of my life was was immersed in um, in 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 my language and 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 also 
cultural understandings and traditions. And I spent a lot of time with, uh, with my, especially my one cuckoo. She uh, lived practically next door. Um, there was a, uh, um, a bush that separated our houses. And so over time, there was this trail that, that uh, connected, connected our homes uh, through, through that particular bush. But um, so I remember spending um, time with her as she was um, picking traditional medicines. And, um, and also in her garden, she, was, she just spent, uh, loved spending time outside. And, um, and just um, observing, not that there was uh, times a whole lot of conversation, um, but uh, listening in different ways. Um, and there is so much to listen to if, uh, if, if, we, um, if we are open to it, right? If, if, we, uh, if, if we give um, the environment uh, and all that's within the environment, the space to, to actually speak to us in, in different ways again. So I'm here to, um, I think, contribute to that conversation of um, what uh, well, indigenous knowledge is, but also how do we respectfully, um, first of all, what do we access and, and what is open in terms of indigenous knowledges, if anything, and um, or are we speaking more of uh, indigenous histories, the experiences that indigenous peoples have, have, um, have um, I think, um, lived through, uh, especially in recent history. Um, when I do teach about indigenous peoples from a historical sense, I always um, begin uh, prior to European contact. Um, and um, that there was uh, a land here where peoples were very much economically engaged with each, other's, each other and um, peoples who developed treaties with each other and had existing leadership and governance uh, systems. And, um, and so it's those, um, it's those systems, I think, a way of, uh, a way of organizing that, that I'm really interested in. And some of the foundational knowledges um, that, um, that speak to the interconnectedness of humanity uh, to, to creation um, that I think will help us to, uh, to live together uh, in much better and respectful ways. I come from a family, um, the, uh, my family actually, um, the, uh, the Soto people, uh, but my particular family did come from uh, uh, Ontario, Ontario area. And uh, so our oral history um, that, that I've learned over the years um, just um, communicates the, uh, the protection of knowledge especially ceremonial knowledge and practices and traditions. So we had runners in our family. Basically, um, our family fled the East to protect that knowledge. And, um, and so um, my particular part of the fam uh, my family stayed in Saskatchewan, but there were three brothers, um, and they would have been my great, great, uh, I think great grand grandfathers traveled even further west to protect, to protect the knowledge. And they ended up in the mountains, um, and there are sacred spaces in the mountains. And so I had the privilege um, of, of meeting one of my relatives in a roundabout way. He was, he was uh, an elder who was contributing and supporting um, uh, a PA, an ed, actually an EDD student that I was supervising. And so she learned about uh, this family or this group called the Runners and was very curious about it. Um, and, um, and so that story and what it entails, I'm still trying to, uh, to learn the, the depth of it all. And I, and I think there, um, that'll take some time as, as Elder Maria had mentioned, um, it feels like the, the pieces are, are scattered and, um, and each person has, has uh, a part of that, that puzzle. 
So it's, uh, and the only way that we can gain, that I can gain understanding is by talking to people individually and, and learning their stories. And those stories aren't um, in um, open access or uh, they're not stored um, in, in, a technical, in a database somewhere. Right, so, so there's that kind of uh, connection that we are, um, I think, is is very valuable uh, even today. And um, what else can I say? So, in terms of of knowledge, is again, um, there's there's that ceremonial aspect that I think is has to be earned. Uh, many of our elders um, apprenticed for about 16 years in order to gain access to some knowledge and they go through a lot of ceremony. And, um, and so for um, non-Indigenous people to come to an elder and actually um, uh, request that knowledge without, without actually earning it um, is, um, is somewhat disrespectful sometimes, and so there needs to be um, there needs to be um, that kind of informing um, and education that has to happen within our academies. Um, and yeah, I, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> so this is your chance, Mary. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So I just want to start by saying how grateful I am um, to be brought in. I know it's not traditional to do this with somebody at a distance in this way. So I uh, am incredibly appreciative of that. Um, I am a mom, and that's what's keeping me here in Victoria this week. I have a 10-year-old daughter who's having some struggles, and so I'm, I'm mumming right now. Um, my, uh, my ancestors are Celts from what we now call Scotland, and um, that's deeply embedded in me. Um, my dad was a teacher, and so like many of you, there was no question that my brother and sister and I would go to university, and we've all done that. And, uh, uh, and I've also been lucky enough to be a settler on uh, both Cowich and then Lagunquin traditional territory for my life, and um, have... Uh, just been really grateful for that experience and, and to be um, in amongst those communities. I'm not here to champion open pedagogy. I'm here to talk about open pedagogy because I think um, it's really important to think about these different, uh, these different ways of educating as options. Um, one of the things that's most important to me in my work is providing flexibility for both students and educators. Um, because when we can learn in ways that are meaningful for us, we learn more deeply. And so, um, so I think there's great power in open pedagogy, but I don't think it's always the right, uh, the right way of educating, and particularly when we get into uh, the conversation about traditional knowledge, I think there are some limits uh, absolutely there and some protocols that need to be respected. Um, why I do this work, uh, on a professional level, I'm really lucky in the fact that my skill set connects me with work that's incredibly meaningful to me and to people who need me to do that work. So I'm actually able to enact change in my job and, and help other people work towards equity. Um, so it's really meaningful. Uh, on a personal level, <laughs> um, Unlike Elder Maria, I'm actually getting angrier as I get older, and I'm finding myself wanting to speak truth to power a lot more and, um, and seeing things that, uh, that are not just and wanting to be an ally uh, for people who need help speaking um, and, and to find ways of helping them get their voices out. Um, and in terms of, of why I'm here, because Heather asked me, um, <laughs> But also, and I would do anything Heather asked me, um, but also I, I do think it's a vital conversation to, to be having. Um, we've been doing work in this area um, in BC for a while as well. And um, we did have Corey, we were lucky enough to have Corey come and speak at an event that we did. And as much as uh, a huge portion of the audience loved it, um, there were some people there who didn't understand the 
open and traditional knowledge uh, tension. And so I think we obviously have some work to do, and, and I'm here to pitch in with that work. Thank you. Thank you very. Thank you very much. So um, we have two foci in this conference, and so not everybody may have attended to each of the of both of the sessions. So I was just wondering if one of you could briefly just tell us a little bit about why um, why are we why is open uh, an important part of, uh, of the process? So describe a little bit about open in a post-secondary institutional perspective. David, you're holding the mic. I've got some things too. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, or Mary could go if you'd like. Uh, I just was. Sorry, David. <laughs> um, what I had made a note of, and and just by the way, everything I learned about Open, I learned from David Porter. So, just so we get that right up front. Um, so a couple of primary things that make open and really important, and the first of those obviously is access. It makes makes uh, makes learning resources affordable, uh, and so we can get closer to having all students having their hands on the learning resources that they need. But what's equally important is what students and educators can do with open. So because of the way uh, the licenses work when we're using open resources. Educators and students have the ability to customize, localize, and adapt learning resources so that it can be more meaningful to the students. Um, and, and when it's more meaningful, it's a much more powerful learning tool, obviously, right? And so, for example, when we can adapt a learning resource so that students can connect with local knowledge as part of big learning uh, a bigger concept, um, then they learn it more deeply and retain that knowledge. So, so that's some of what I would say is the power of open. I think it's also a wonderful expression of academic freedom. And the notion is that um, as participants in the academy, um, we create knowledge all the time. We create knowledge collaboratively with our students. We create knowledge through research. Uh, we bring ideas to the classroom and share them freely within that environment. And one of the things that's not well understood by a lot of people about open licensing is that it is an expression of copyright. That is, that it works with copyright, not against copyright. It is your rights as a creator of a work to express those rights far beyond uh, just holding them intact for yourself and expressing those rights as yours only. Um, and one of the things that happened in early 2000 was that a legal group uh, took a look at how they could expand the, the rights contained in creative works and give the creators the opportunity to express those rights more broadly for others to use. A kind of gifting of knowledge. And it's that gifting of knowledge that is inherent in the open movement. The notion that a creator has the right to say how far their knowledge can be extended. And if sacred knowledge should not be extended, then it shouldn't be extended. Um, but I think that there are common educational portions of knowledge that lead to the betterment of society in all fields of work and our opportunity with the open uh, education ideal is to broadly spread good ideas and purposeful, useful knowledge well beyond ourselves. And that's the essence of openness. Um, maybe you could describe just a little bit about the Creative Commons license, because that's a key element of what you're talking about. Right, so the, the, the regime that's used is called Creative Commons. It's a set of six licenses that allow knowledge to be extended in a very simple way so that anyone seeing the license knows how they can use it. It's called a human readable deed. There's also legalese behind it and electronic code to embed it within electronic works. But the licenses range from completely open 
do whatever you like with it as long as you attribute me as the creator to specifying restrictions like if you got it for free, you have to pass it along for free. That's called share alike. Or it can't be used commercially if I gave it to you for free. That's the non-commercial provision. Or if it's something like a creative or sacred work, there is a no derivatives uh, license as well that says it can't be changed in any way. It must stay in the format that you received it. So those kinds of opportunities are ways of passing along knowledge. And uh, Corey and I were on a Simon Fraser University website this morning and found a set of traditional knowledge licenses as well that extend to things like place and season and other kinds of ways of expressing rights in how knowledge can be used. Very interesting. We didn't explore it very deeply, but to see that someone is thinking about it means that this is not an uncommon idea or matter that people would like to consider. Does that help? Yeah, that's very helpful. So I'm gonna ask my other guests to talk about the benefits of indigenization to post-secondary institutions in a brief way. <laughs> I like it's, the high points. It's gonna make the institution better and stronger. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I just, uh, quickly, I mean, I think the reality is indigenous people have been excluded from the academy for so long, and I th um, so we have to be included, just as we have to be included in Canadian society. But I think it's important to know that when we talk about indigenous knowledge, there's a lot of different types of indigenous knowledge. So there's just the bare basic fact that every institution has to be teaching the real authentic history of indigenous people in Canada. We were here first, this is our land, we contributed to the building of this country. I mean, what more can you contribute than the land? Uh, let alone all of the other things. We have a lot to offer and a lot of strengths in our culture. So that basic history has to be included. And then we have the other knowledge that is our cultural and spiritual knowledge. And my system of governance is the potlatch. So what is the potlatch? What's that about? There's that type of information. There's also my personal story. And then there's also the very traditional knowledge of what happens in our sacred ceremonies, whether it's in the big house or whether it's in the long house, whether it's in your Sundance ceremonies. So there's different levels of our knowledge. And, and often I have found in the academy that people say, well, that's indigenous knowledge. We can't include that. Or I, I'm not comfortable teaching indigenous knowledge. And really what they're saying is that I, I just don't, you know, and this is, they don't want to include uh, you know, when they're talking about teaching prehistory or history of Canada prior to 1867, oh, I'm not comfortable, te it's history. You're comfortable teaching about Greeks and Romans and you're not Greek or Roman, so why can't you teach our history, our authentic part of, you're not teaching about the sacred sun dance, you're teaching about what is legit and an authentic history in this land. So this uncomfortableness and the same, I think I mentioned this yesterday, very intelligent people in this room that are very capable of research. Research, learn, seek that information. So going, it's important to remember there are different types of indigenous knowledge and, and some which we would agree that you don't, that can't be copyrighted or can't be exposed publicly, but then there's a whole bunch, that, but that can't prevent you from sharing other knowledge or including other knowledge. So I was, in, in terms of, I think, the, the levels of Indigenous knowledges that, um, that uh, Corey has uh, just spoken about, it's, it's also really important to, um, that's where the, the extensive work begins. And uh, having those conversations uh, amongst each other within the academy, but also being willing to, as, as faculty and staff and senior leadership and administrators, the whole community to, to, um, to engage in um, prof pro well, learning, right? Um, whether it's through professional development, but being informed and educated um, about um, um, indigenous knowledges in, in the various levels. And I think an example of, um, uh, that, I can, that I can share is um, as a, um, one of my doctoral students um, and he was non-indigenous, uh, wrote, sent me um, a draft of, of his, uh, his proposal. And in the propo proposal, he wrote something that um, I immediately stopped. <laughs> 
you know, and, and I thought, this really cannot be in here. And uh, so basically what he was sharing was, uh, was ceremony in, in the written document. And I, I talked with him, and he said, well, you know, but I was a part of this. And, um, and so um, I wasn't able to convince him um, that this uh, should not be in, in the document and that really the permission had to come from, from the community. Um, and he wasn't, he, he felt he had already gained that permission because, because he was a part of ceremony. And, uh, and so in that instance, um, I chose to walk away from, from, that, uh, from that particular relationship, uh, primarily because um, he, um, he didn't, uh, he wasn't open to, to hearing uh, my perspective on this. And um, ultimately what had happened is um, he, uh, over time, I'm not sure how he, how he reached that, but the direction of his, of his research and actually the whole topic of his research changed. And, um, but, so there, there is this, um, I think, um, process of, of learning that, that needs to happen, um, in not only about our histories, but, but about um, the, the sacredness and the respect that's required when engaging uh, with, with indigenous knowledges uh, in particular. Um, in, in histories, again, um, I think that is something that, um, that, we, can, that we can research. Um, and there are so many um, very um, renowned, capable, um, just uh, indigenous scholars that, that I look up to, who um, you know, whose literature and research that that um, that people get go to, um, and and so we are in a different uh, place and time um, than we were, I'd say, in 20 years ago, in relation to that, because because those scholars um, are publishing and their work is accessible. Okay, so you guys have all intimated this idea that there's boundaries, that indigenous knowledge isn't free, and that's kind of juxtaposed against the ethos of open. So why are you guys up on this stage sharing it? What is that all about? What's your opinions? How is this, why, is it, why are we here together as two separate distinct areas of change at the post-secondary institution? Okay, she said I have to go ahead. <laughs> I wasn't really listening because I was trying to get you to answer the question. Um, okay, so indigenous knowledge and the concept of being free. Again, I think uh, we have a lot to offer as indigenous people. I mean, our fundamental knowledge is, I think, in essence, human knowledge. It just hasn't been viewed by the academy or by those that create laws and create the policies and create the institutions in this country as a valid form of knowledge. It's just like indigenous art is great and wins awards because it's indigenous art, but they're not deemed part of the group of seven or not deemed part of the, of the, the masters, if you will. So we're always been, we've always been othered as indigenous people. And yet really, if you look at the core of our knowledge and our, our understanding of the universe, it's fundamental human knowledge. And we're seeing, uh, whether it's in family law, whether it's in, uh, even in the environmental movement, we're seeing our nations and our, our nation return to values that are values that indigenous people have had since the beginning of time. So this knowledge that we have is something that the world is turning to. You know, you can't get a divorce in British Columbia with children involved without going to mediation. The way of solving disputes is, a, is an indigenous way. Making, and you see with the, the sad the situation in northern Manitoba, the, the parents of the boys are including the man that, that ran over their children as we've got to make this right. And we're seeing that in mediation and we're seeing that in, in actions that people are starting to take. So there is something there that has to be included. And that it's just a way of being and relating to each other and the connections and the interconnectedness that as indigenous people we've always seen. I mean, there's no reason 
if there wasn't connections between us in British Columbia where we actually developed a language of trade because there was so much trade that happened bef prior to contact. They developed a separate language called Chinook and they said we were primitive and said we didn't understand business and we didn't understand entrepreneurship and we didn't understand those types of things. Yet we're seeing now we are coming together, we're recognizing that we need to be inclusive, we're recognizing the strength of diversity. So this idea of including Indigenous people and Indigenous knowledge, again, the different levels, and I don't think it conflicts with the, the idea of it being open. Some knowledge, of course, is traditional knowledge and shouldn't be shared because it is sacred, but then the knowledge of Indigenous people, of certain Indigenous practices or views of the world is something that should be shared and would have had the Europeans had a different perspective on indigenous people upon arrival and recognized the beauty and brilliance of my people and my culture and my system of governance that was based on merit. It wasn't based on birth order. It wasn't based on male domination. It was based on equality and based on women, in fact, actually being viewed as superior to men. Right? We're, we're seeing this whole movement now to women being equal. And I shared this story yesterday. My granny was asked, uh, constantly asked, why aren't you supporting these feminists? Why aren't you supporting the feminist movement? And her, in her mind, she's like, why would I want to be second class? I'm already better than men. Why do I need to want to, why would I want to be equal to men? So that comes from a long history of a culture that has, in, uh, you know, certainly no culture is perfect. You know, that romanticized version, we warred with each other. We had slaves. We had some of these types of things as well, but it was a system of accountability, transparency, a system that was based on merit. Then you bring in the Indian Act that's completely void of transparency, completely void of accountability, completely void of the voice of women. So I think it's, it, I think in that, those lessons are lessons that can be shared and should be shared and must be included to give us and to support us in what is a, a very complex, uh, challenging world and especially in the sense of you know the divide between the rich and the poor is getting greater how do we include everybody and give everybody the same opportunities because if we don't we've seen what's happened in countries uh, where the, the voice the marginalized voice hasn't been included so it's abs an absolute must I, I just wanted to clarify something about open that people who aren't familiar with it might not know. I, I had an instructor come to me who I had been talking to about an open textbook and he said, this is interesting. Would it be okay if I shared this with a friend of mine who's not at the institution? And we've been talking about open in terms of increasing access for students and, and lowering costs, but if something's open, it's not just limited to people who can be in, who are in the institution. Anybody can learn from these resources. And one of the reasons I wanna be having this conversation now as we're moving forward with talking about indigenizing and decolonizing higher ed, is I, I don't want commercial publishers coming in and saying, yes, we'll publish the content that you're talking about that you do feel can be shared, and we'll charge your students $200 for the book. Because th that it only helps those who can afford the $200 book, and it's not, we can't share that with the community anymore. And I don't wanna see the knowledge that is okay to be shared locked down under a dollar sign for somebody's profit as opposed to being able to share and spread that knowledge that we do need. I, both of you are, are really eloquent about, about uh, but I guess what, I'm, what I feel like I can contribute is uh, you know, do most people know how long it takes to be able to get some of that knowledge? You know, you have people come and they'll give you a little bit of tobacco and maybe a, a bit of cloth. And I'm not talking about me. I see this happening to a lot of elders in the community who many of them don't speak hardly any English, uh, the really old people. You have uh, researchers coming in and they, they want information, so they, they, they've maybe taken this in class, but don't realize the years and years it's taken that elder to get that, that knowledge, whether it's, it's uh, hunting knowledge, whether it's food knowledge, whether it's ceremonial knowledge, because even with food, there's, there's a whole bundle of stuff that goes with it. There are protocols that go with that, and I'm not talking about just 
ordinary everyday food when you're living in the city, but I'm talking about food that has to happen, that has to be prepared for ceremony. That takes years. I'm 78, and, and just the knowledge I have, which is really limited, I've been taught since I was a little girl. You know, from the time that I was old enough to maybe before I could understand. And, and the really strict rules that, that are applied to it and what can happen, not just to you. And people will say, well, that's really superstitious and whatever. But we're taught that if you misuse that, that knowledge, then it's not you that's going, it's not going to come back on you. It's going to come back on your family and it could come back three generations from now. And, and if you know anything about the history of your own people and, and, and you've been taught that, you see that happening in, in families sometime where, you know, where is all of this coming from? And there are special things that you do to, to clean that up. I've had people come to me and, and they'll say, but, but why can't I have that knowledge? I have a very closed lodge. I, there's no tourism at my house. You come and you work and you have to, you have to become a part of that family. And, and I sometimes feel bad because people come and they, they just want to come and, and try it. And I always think of my mentor who told me that if, you, if you're going to run to ceremonies all the time and run to a lodge all the time just so you can pick things here and there and then go off, the only thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to end up wrinkled from sitting in that, in that sweat lodge. You're not going to really learn any information. And that it's funny, but really it's, that's, there, there's a lesson in, in even just something like that. I don't think that... I, I know from, because I went to graduate school and I, 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 I took indigenous studies and I know that many of the people whom I had as profs meant well, and, and, but they didn't know what they, <laughs> what they were talking about. They didn't, they didn't understand. They had been to a ceremony once they had, uh, or they had, somebody had uh, told a story they heard it and they came back and put that as part of their class. So my concern is, is that who, who are the people that are going to take care of this knowledge? You know, uh, I don't believe that the people who take care of the knowledge should be just indigenous academics who have no, no uh, cultural training or anything. It's not that I'm against indigenous academics, I believe they should know their language, and when I'm talking about language, I'm not talking, because you can, you can speak your language, but you can be a Catholic Cree. You can be a, an Anglican Cree. Where are you grounded? This is one of the things that most of the elders that I had always reminded me. From what place are you speaking? Are you speaking from your Cree leg, or are you speaking from your English? You know, which which foot you have to be, you have to be grounded in that one place if you're going to take care of, of all of this, this stuff. And, and you, you can be as modern as you want to be and still be grounded in that place, but you can't speak from two places. And, and again, we just think if somebody speaks the language, then it means that, that they understand. It's wonderful that they speak the language, but an Anglin Anglican perspective is a different perspective. It's not the one that's grounded in territory and place. So, I mean, there's all of those things, and I can't, you know, I can't articulate the academic part, but you can, you know, and so are the people in our lodge. They are, that's what their job is when they come there. Sometimes they get annoyed with me because I tell them, I don't want you to repeat back what I just told you. I want you to explain to me how we can, we can share that with other people so that, so that we're in control of it using the, 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 uh, the colonial language because that language is only a tool. It's not, I mean, it was stolen from everybody else before it ever got to us. So let's use it like it's, um, like we learn to use everything else, beads and everything. You can make something beautiful out of it. 
but we have to own that language. And that language has to have a mother. It's got to be grounded in the place that we come from. Mary, did you want to say anything? anything? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I could not agree more. And I, I, I do share, uh, I do share um, Elder Maria's concerns. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking was whether one of the things we need to be thinking about is rather than sharing the traditional knowledge, we're sharing the protocol. So we're, we're sharing information about how traditional knowledge is managed, but not the traditional knowledge itself, so that we're building an understanding of why that matters. And I, so it just occurs to me that that might be one of the, one of the things, certainly in the work that um, the, the group that corey has been part of, that BC Campus has been working with, and the resources that they've been creating to help with indigenization, what I've been really struck by in them is how good they are at explaining why it matters that we do things in a certain way, um, to give people that context rather than, Here's traditional knowledge. Oh, by the way, you can't tell this to people. So it's, it's more on the front end, the explanation about the protocol rather than sharing the knowledge itself. Thank you. Anything more? Because now we're going to get real. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> and I that wasn't real. Oh, this, uh, sorry. We're going to get a little bit more real. Um, so this is what I want to know. Can is I just say one more yes, thing? please. This okay. is your floor. And I'll, and I'll be really fast. When I'm talking about language and, and, and the translation or, or passing it on, that doesn't mean that somebody that that uh, that uh, an academic or student, because uh, most of my my uh, lodge people don't speak our language. The the thing is using the English language like it's your language, taking it and owning it and using it from the place that you come from. If, does that make sense? So I, I, I just want to be really clear for anybody who doesn't speak the language. You, if you can't learn the language, don't decide that you can't, you can't do this, especially for those of you who are indigenous people because uh, that's not, you know, there, there are people in all our communities that are, that are, that it's their job to, to carry the language. There'll always be people like that, and those are the people that you, you seek out if that's the kind of work that you want to do. And, and, and work with that elder, teach them. My, my, the people I mentor teach me all the time. I don't know half of the stuff that, I know it in my own way, but I don't, I don't know what to do with it. And so when I share it with them, it's their job to then teach me about that language. So that teaching has to be back and forth. And, and the scary part about, for me, is, is um, what happens if we have a people that don't, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> I hear people say that all the time, you know, a, a teacher needs a student. But man, you go into some of those classrooms, and I've been in them as a student, and, and you have somebody that just has ultimate power and authority over you. And, and they get that knowledge, how are they going to use it? Exactly. Okay, so I'm just gonna let you guys know, we're gonna ask one more question, and then I'm gonna open up the floor to the audience. So if you have any really tough questions, now it's time to formulate them and get them ready. <laughs> I want these people to feel a little bit nervous. Okay, so my next question for you guys is, is can indigenization and open succeed or even thrive within the current structure of post-secondary institutions? It's an easy one. We need change. We, we need, we were having this conversation, so we, we all had dinner last night, except for Mary, sorry. Um, we all had dinner last night. We were having these conversations, and I don't, I don't know, from, from my perspective, I don't know that, that 
open can thrive. I don't know that indigenization can thrive, internationalization, um, improved pedagogy overall. I don't know if they can thrive under the current system because I, I did a presentation yesterday and I was talking about the feedback I've gotten from instructors on how we can advance open, the ones who are doing it. And I was told by several of them, teaching, improving pedagogy, doing, integrating improved pedagogical processes around internationalization, indigenization, open, don't fit the check boxes for tenure and promotion. That has to change or we're not going anywhere. Yeah, and that, that was a discussion that we had last night also. And so uh, when you consider, when you consider um, um, it, it is a, a bit of a, a system overhaul that, that needs to happen in order, in order to accommodate, um, I would say, respectful um, engagement with Indigenous peoples and, and our knowledges. And, uh, and so in terms, uh, when you have uh, Indigenous people within the academy, one of the things that um, I, I, I'm actually part of this, this writing group, I have um, uh, three they're not probably in their fourth year of, of the academy that I've been working with and, and helping to mentor. And uh, so um, we, wrote, we wrote our first article together. And of course we have that conversation of who's going to be first author. And, um, and these are, these are uh, young indigenous scholars. And uh, so, and what they've heard is that being first author means a lot, right? Because, uh, and all the rest are et al, right? So it'll be um, Smith et al, right? So if, if I was third, um, third author in line, you know, I'm et al, right? <laughs> and, and so what does that mean? And, and that matters to some people. And why do we, why do we um, shorten um, our references to et al, first of all, is a question. And, um, and so um, basically what we decided, even though um, there is, um, I think we all put in equal amounts of time and energy into the articles that we've been writing, um, we've just decided to go in order and, and still challenging the system and asking through our, through our writings and saying, um, um, you know, how can this work within the existing framework? Uh, these kinds of, of, um, of partnerships and collaborations, right? Especially if we are sitting around, um, you know, a, a sitting in a circle um, and talking about, talking about um, the topic that we're writing about. Right and um, where where is where there is no beginning and end to that circle, right? So um, it's um, it's not just um, um, you know whether, and I do agree that um, um, new spaces uh, need to be created. We are forging, I believe, in, into new territory, um, and uh, but what are we willing to let go? Uh, in order to, to ensure that, um, that uh, open access and, uh, and respectful engagement with Indigenous people actually gains some ground. Um, and um, and we, we do have to have those conversations about um, what we're counting as important in our assessment, um, in our assessment and evaluation. Um, and so, in terms of um, the the indigenous young indigenous scholars I'm mentoring, I'm saying, well, this is this is how you know this is what matters or what's supposed to matter. But um, in terms of um, our our annual performance reviews, but you know this is really how we're going to um, and we negotiate that together. This is how we're going to function function as a group within the existing, but still challenging, um, challenging that system um, for, for transformation. And so we do have a long way to go, right? and I still feel that we're, we're in the, 
very beginning phases of it and how it's going to look I'm not I'm not totally sure but I, I do know that it's not it may not be an easy process um, you know with um, with creativity comes struggle um, and uh, that's just a part of the process but but how do we move through that is is a question and and of course there's that idea of um, of generosity and that's something that's I'd say is ingrained in a lot of indigenous peoples is generosity um, and uh, and I do believe that over history over time that generosity has been violated and so how can trust be gained um, how can be how can there be repair and redress and healing um, in order for um, uh, true reciprocity or respectful reciprocity, which is so important when you're considering, um, again, respectful engagement with indigenous people and open access, right? So there is a fear with open access in a sense that um, there is um, perhaps no mentor beside you to, to actually um, fill in the, the important gaps of that knowledge, like elder, um, you know, our elders within the room, um, Elder Maria, and I think that's one thing that we have to really encourage uh, people who have, you know, this, this knowledge that is open and shared um, with generosity that it's not violated, right? And so, who do we go to to help inform us uh, and guide us through that particular knowledge that's, uh, that's written or, or provided through us through other forms of, of media? Um, so that's, I believe, a responsibility that we have also. So the academy functions on um, a set of frameworks, policies, models of practice. And I think what we're really suggesting is that we need some alt forms of that to begin to emerge. Um, the whole open movement uh, in Canada really got its legs in British Columbia, and now it's kind of moved east based on great practices that have happened. So I'm really interested in the work that Cory and BC Campus are doing with their indigenous resource uh, framework and the open resources they're creating and really trying to understand what kinds of protocols and frameworks and models of practice they put in place to make that happen because if it's successful and if it is an alt framework for doing business then we should be trying to emulate it in other jurisdictions across Canada learning from it localizing it to local realities uh, adding cultural components that make meaning for people who live in those communities. Um, Canada's a big country, and I'm guessing what works in British Columbia probably works 70% for the rest, but there's probably a whole bunch more that needs to be done. So I'm really interested in what Mary and Corey have been doing to get that intersection between open and indigenous resources happening for real. Mary, did you have anything to add? Sure. I mean, I, I think what I can say about the resources, as I was saying earlier, is that they are um, they're intended to help people do the work, not to be um, definitive in any way, um, really more around four different roles in the academy, how to work towards minimization. Um, so, for example, one of them is for curriculum developers, and it's very helpful um, for helping uh, helping folks understand how to design activities in ways that are respectful of Indigenous knowledge and ways of being and learning. Um, and so, uh, and Tori can speak more to this, but I, I think that our, our next step is really getting those resources into the institutions and helping them localize and actually make use of them and then we'll sort of see that's where the rubber's going to hit the road about whether or not it's going to work okay um so there was no definitive yes or no in those answers if i but there was a lot of support for the idea that it could be successful um one of the things we talked about last night and then after this question we're going to take a break let you think a little bit more and then we'll come back and let you ask your questions 
Um, but one of the things we talked about was the perception of validity and relevance in post-secondary institutions as, as a key part, part of its ability to be successful inside a post-secondary institution. Can somebody talk to that, the level of the perceptions of relevance and validity? Please. <laughs> Relevance and validity in what yeah. context? Uh, the relevance and validity of open and indigenous knowledges inside of, uh, of the institution. So I can speak from the indigenous perspective is that I often have times where I've had t conversations with faculty and staff where they, they've brought forward the idea of either using an indigenous methodology or an indigenous assessment in a teaching and learning perspective and everything like that. And they've been told, well, that's really nice, but it doesn't really reach the rigors of teaching and learning. And so, and I know I think that I've even heard this from an open perspective as well. So really at some level, the acceptance and ability for open and uh, indigenization to thrive, especially in a teaching and learning context, is its perception of validity and relevance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Lots of shaking heads. We, we get a lot of comments about it's poor quality. It's free, it must not be good. Um, or it won't work in my discipline, and then I point to a professor who's using it in their discipline. Um, we've been doing this for several years now. BC is the champion, and I, I say this, every open session I give, I would not be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for the work of Mary and David and Amanda Coolidge at BC, um, who have done so much work, and there's so many courses now that are using open across Canada. It does work. The research shows there's been actual peer-reviewed research, several studies, showing that students in courses using open textbooks do at least as well, if not better, than in courses that use commercial because more students can access them. So it's not hurting students academically to use an open textbook. It, we're gonna hear this argument, it's free, it must not be good. Um, it's not traditional academia, it must not be good. And we need to push back on that because the research is showing, at le in open at least, that it is as good, if not better. And I, I think from the indigenous perspective, I, again, if people who, pr who purport or who, who perpetuate those arguments haven't checked themselves. I mean, it, the academy comes, we know exactly how these academies were created. The institutional bias and the systemic discrimination that are, is in the academy has precluded any indigenous knowledge, methods and ways of knowing and being. So you've excluded a whole population. And if you're clinging to the idea that the rigor is somehow less because indigenous knowledge is included, or I've heard people say, well, this class has so many indigenous people, it must be dumbed down in some way, or because you're evaluating in, in an open pedagogy kind of way with, uh, you know, the, the students create the, the assignment or, the, you know, they mark each other or whatever they do. What is the goal of the academy? The academy's goal is to make us enhance the knowledge that a student has, ensure that they have that knowledge and they're capable of advancing to the next level, whether that's in the K-12 system or in the public or in the post-secondary system, that is the goal. How we get to the goal doesn't really matter, especially if that student, even in, you see, and, and I appreciate what you say about BC, BC has put a lot of work into this. In the K-12 system, system, it was a directive from the Ministry of, from Ed, Ministry of Education that every, every course in the K-12 system is indigenized across the curriculum. That means every grade and every subject matter. So how would we indigenize mathematics? Well, do your research on math and know that math originated with indigenous people in the Americas almost at the same time as it did in South, South in Southern India. That we, we have contributed to scientific knowledge as indigenous people that can be included. And really what is, you know, the, the idea of indigenous uh, methods and approaches is group work indigenous, right? We, we, we have to start thinking and, and get away from this othering and othering ourselves, uh, the academy, others, indigenous people and indigenous methods. And if you are thinking that way, ask yourself why. Why am I thinking that way? Why do I think my my way is better. Who influenced me? What investment do you have? Many are vested in keeping the system the same way. It's not going to work. Eventually the academy is going to implode if we don't start including the voices and uh, the diverse voices in this country and within and thinking outside the box. 
gone are the days of the, po the, you know, you go, and we all know, you go to university, you used to be able to get a degree, then get a job and stay there for 30 years. That is not how it works now in today's global economy. And in this, we need to be, prepare our students to pivot the needs. My one daughter just completed UBC, or first year UBC, it's $23,000. Who can afford that? Who can afford that in today's economy? So then, and we need educated people. We are bringing in immigrants from around the world because we have a brain drain. We don't have enough people to fill the jobs that are even being vacated by baby boomers. How are we going to contribute? How are we going to, rather than be against the system and keep othering indigenous people and indigenous knowledge and other groups, work with us, be with us, and create something that's innovative and that prepares students to pivot, that acknowledges their backgrounds, acknowledges the challenges in their histories and in their lives. And it, we all will be better for it. And talking about studies, again, peer-reviewed studies, massive, massive information out there where including the voice of others makes it better. There's no, just as simple as I said yesterday, including women in your senior leadership dramatically changes how a company functions, how people, how a meeting runs, how, it's just unbelievable. And that one voice can make that different. It's a different perspective. And we all are vested, of course, in the success of this nation. We all want our children to succeed. We have to stop othering and we just have to do it. And maybe you begrudgingly do it, but you know, <laughs> at least you check the box. Um, because that is a start for some people, right? So some people will start only checking the box, but then I guarantee we'll, we can convert them and they will get it eventually. And I think in terms of, of relevance and validity, you have to, we have to consider um, what we count as relevant and, and valid. And so um, relevance and validity really stems from a particular uh, belief and value system. And so each of us has to, has to consider that for ourselves. Uh, what is influencing our perceptions of validity and, and relevance? And, and where, does, where does that come from? Um, when you look at um, the history of, as uh, um, you know, J.R. Miller kind of talks about rights about Indian white relations, um, so when you, when you consider uh, the history of, of Indian white relations, um, you will learn that, um, and even before that, archaeologists, uh, what were some of the words that they were using to describe in indigenous peoples across the Americas? Primitive, right? And that's been um, that uh, in savage um, and less than. Um, those stereotypes um, have become belief systems. Uh, an Indian problem. How do we solve the Indian problem? That, again, perpetuated uh, and internalized over generations. And so that spills into, uh, into the academy because really, you know, we, we function um, on values and belief systems. So we have to think about our thinking and we, we have to consider the validity and the relevance of our own thinking, our values and belief systems for, for today's, uh, today's context. And as I mentioned yesterday, one in 10 uh, indigenous people in Canada live in Saskatchewan, right? And so if you don't know anything about indigenous histories, why is that when you're surrounded by indigenous peoples? And, um, and so in terms of, of relevance of indigenous methodologies, um, indigenous researchers have been challenging um, um, that for some time now. And, and because the message that we've been getting is um, indigenous research or indigenous methodologies are, um, you know, they're not as rigorous. Um, and um, community-driven research, community-based research, is not as rigorous, right? And I've had um, and I've had applications that um, that have or grants that have been rejected because of that. Uh, we don't see the rigor in this. From whose perspective, right? So in um, community-driven research, takes a lot longer time to establish if it's going to be done right. 
Um, I'm working with one First Nation community in northern Alberta, and um, you know that relationship has taken three years. If my um, if my academic career was dependent on um, on the kind of research I do, I, I you know I don't think I could have been um, come as far as I have. I you know I wouldn't. You know, because really all I've done is um, community-driven research, but I've had to do other forms of research to ensure that, um, that I, my work was valued within the academy. But that's changing. Um, and anyone who's been engaged in community-driven research will, will know that um, it is, you know, there's, there's a whole set of um, standards and, and ways of engaging with the community um, that um, is, is just as relevant and valid. And you know what, in the, in the long run, the research is going to mean a lot more to the community um, than, and um, so what you're leaving as a researcher, as an academic, is um, is much more. Um, I think it's a it's more of a purposeful, reciprocal um, relationship, and and you know again more impactful in the long run.